Well, good evening. We uh, need to remember our pastor in prayer, and uh, he has gone to the dark continent and to the very southern climes, uh, far, far in the south of South Africa, and he'll be there until the first of the week when he will be going north to what used to be called Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia. Today they're known as Zambia and Zimbabwe. But we need to pray for Robbie and Pam, and uh, they're traveling with the Donahoes, so we need to pray for them. And um, we have some items for praise. Also, we've got good news about Herman Maddox that... Uh, what they thought might be a term tumor on his brain, close to the stem brain cell, uh, brain stem, uh, turns out it is not a tumor and it's not cancer. Uh, rather, it is uh, apparently some old blood from the stroke that he had before. So he's out of ICU now, and so uh, we're just praising the Lord uh, for that. But continue to pray for him. Uh, he's still in the hospital, uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, Saw Morgan Franklin yesterday. Lord has blessed him also with that uh, kidney operation he had. And uh, boy, he's just looking good and he's ready to go back to work. So we praise the Lord for answered prayer there. Um, ask that you continue to pray for Ukraine. We've had some good news in the past week that uh, Ukraine has had some victories in the east uh, around the big city of Kharkiv. And uh, we just praise the Lord for that. They've uh, been able to take control of several thousand square miles uh, of territory, which is great. And they've also captured a lot of materiel, high-end equipment, as well as ammunition. And the report was they now have so many POWs, they don't know where to put them all. So uh, th this is good. But... Um, that there is still fighting going on. Uh, this war is far from being over, and uh, the, the Russians are uh, moving more troops to the south, and so uh, be in prayer for uh, our people in Ukraine and the uh, war that's going on there because people are still dying every day, and the Russians continue to send missiles into many cities around the country. Uh, so there's a lot of bombing that continues uh, even today. Uh, I would ask you also to remember to pray about the evangelism project that's coming up at uh, Fort Bend County Fair, which will be not this weekend, but the following two weekends. And I want to talk a little more about that because I think it's important for us to take advantage of opportunities that we have to do evangelism. It's important for us as individuals, it's important for us as a church, and I believe it's also important for the body of Christ, especially at this time. We see so much evil in the world today, and to a great extent I lay this at the feet of churches that have failed in teaching the Word of God and preparing people to face what is going on in the world around us. So uh, as we come to uh, our study of the Word of God tonight, uh, let's uh, prepare ourselves, making sure that uh, we are in fellowship and uh, prepared for God's Word. Let us pray. I give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that we have freedom and we can come together and open the Bible and proclaim it as absolute truth and declare that you are the only true God and that Jesus is the only Savior, the only way to the Father. We pray that you will continue to keep America free so that we can continue to have freedom to proclaim this message here in the U.S. but also around the world. We pray, Father, for the deans as they are 
on vacation. I pray that you'll give them a safe journey, safe time, but one also that is just a real pleasure for them, relaxing. And I pray that uh, you're going to watch over and care for them and keep them in health uh, while they're gone. But I uh, pray that you'll safely bring them back also. We thank you also for your wonderful grace, uh, your mercy in raising up people who have been sick. And uh, we, we know that uh, you've done this for your own glory. We pray also, Father, for people that are hurting, suffering. Uh, many people that are sick and uh, have pain. And uh, we know that you have a purpose for these things as well. I just pray that you're going to be glorified in each life as you uh, show grace and goodness, even in spite of the suffering. I pray now that you will bless our time together as we look at some principles from the Word, that we might be better, better oriented to your plan and prepared in our service for you. We'd ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to talk a little about witnessing uh, as we begin tonight, and uh, this is going to tie into our subject of missions, which is what I'm going to be doing on the weeknights for the next couple of weeks. I believe that it's important for us to understand some things about witnessing. Why are we here? We are not here for our own purposes. We are here for God's purpose. And he has left you alive at this time, in this place, for his purposes. But the great problem we have today is so many people are focused only on being comfortable. And that is their ultimate goal day by day is just to be comfortable, however they might define that. And as a result, in many instances... Believers are not fulfilling their purpose in this life, and they are not doing the job of telling others about Jesus. And I think that uh, we might say the church has lost its savor, and I might just suggest a couple of reasons why. First of all, I think that there are some doctrines that are forgotten in our thinking. First is the immortality of the soul. We have been given by God a soul which is going to live forever. This body will not, but the person is going to live forever, and we need to keep that in mind. When we look at these people around us who are lost without a Savior, we need to be thinking about the fact that they have an immortal soul and that this life uh, may end, but their soul is going to go on forever. Secondly, we forget also about the fact that all unbelievers are condemned already, that they are lost, that they have need of a Savior. They are under judgment. And we forget about this, and so they may be nice people, and, and, and we, we're not thinking about the fact that if they die without the Lord, that they are going to uh, face God at the great white throne where all will be judged. And those who are at the great white throne ultimately are going to be cast into the lake of fire where they are going to suffer forever and ever. And I think, too, sometimes we forget that we are accountable to God for evangelism. Now, what happens is we tend to want to shift the responsibility for evangelism to the professionals, to the pastor, or to the church, or to those who have a spiritual gift of evangelism. And, and we think, well, that's, that's their job. And, well, yes, I, I suppose I should tell people about Jesus, but really I am not too comfortable doing that. And so uh, this creates problems. That's not the only thing that creates a problem. Okay. I think one reason that we 
aren't doing the evangelism that we ought to do is we have the wrong goals. We've settled for lesser goals than reaching the lost. Many times I've gone into churches and I say, how many of you want to see people saved? Okay? How many want to see people saved? Well, most of you. Okay. <laughs> If you didn't raise their hands, and that's okay. And then I ask the question, well, who do you want to see saved? And then people say, well, everybody. No, no, no. Specifically, who do you want to see saved? And many people say, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. We need to think about it. Who do you want to see saved? Do you have friends, family, loved ones, work associates, neighbors that are lost and on their way to eternity in the lake of fire. Do you? Are you praying for them? Or do we not have any goal with regard to them? Do we have any sense of responsibility? Where are the goals that we might set with regard to the unsaved? Are we praying for them? Do you have a prayer list? Share that prayer list with others. Say, here, I've got these people. Here, here are my top five or my top ten people that I have the greatest burden for. Will you pray with me? And begin to pray. Now, how do you pray for the lost? Don't pray that God will save them. God can't answer that prayer. But you can pray that God is going to Make a way for that person to hear a clear declaration of the gospel. So you can pray that God will bring someone into their life who is not ashamed of the gospel and who is able to clearly present the truth of the gospel. Pray that they will maybe open their Bible and find it. Or, unlikely, but maybe turn on the television and find somebody that has a good gospel, or turn on the radio and hear a gospel presentation. Pray that somebody's going to give them a gospel tract. Or even pray, if you're really bold, that God will give you the opportunity to tell them how they can go to heaven when they die. And so we need to be praying for these people, and we need to be thinking about how can I reach them? And too often I think we've been distracted. Many worthwhile activities. We do a lot of good things, but often they are secondary to our mission to make disciples through evangelism and edification. So I think that we need to evaluate, what am I doing, and is this really the best way for me to be spending my time? And then, of course, I think sometimes or oftentimes with the church today, our witness is nullified by carnality. The world looks at us, and oftentimes the church is a laughing stock and we are ridiculed, and oftentimes it's justified ridicule because they see Christians who are phony. Uh, they see immorality and dishonesty and uh, people that uh, cheat on their taxes or uh, have uh, very filthy mouths, and this is not a good testimony. Uh, and then you have people that full of fear, worry, anxiety, and this is not a good testimony either. You can say, oh, yeah, I know I'm going to go to heaven when I die, but, boy, I'm really scared about the current situation. I don't know what's going to happen. What am I going to do tomorrow? And there are a lot of Christians today living in fear. That's not a good testimony. So how are we going to talk about the confidence that we have in the plan of God if we are living in fear? And then, of course, we have other problems, gossip, maligning, bitterness. And so we do a lot of complaining about what's going on. And I find that many people can talk about the economy, they can talk about politics, they can talk about sports, but they don't want to talk about Jesus. In fact, they're a little bit embarrassed to even say, Jesus, 
They might talk about the Lord. That's a little more generic in their mind or perhaps in the thinking of the people to whom they speak. But we need to tell people about the Savior. And oftentimes, it, you know, we can say, well, how about those, I don't know, who's your baseball team here? It's not the Astros anymore, whoever you've got. Or you want to talk about who's running for political office. Or you're going to talk about the weather. You know, when people bring those things up, do you think you could find a hook whereby you could turn that conversation into spiritual talk? Man, it's so hot. I and mean, it's got to be global warming. Look what's happening. Oh, it's just horrible. And you can say, you know, I was reading something about that. And the Bible says that we're not going to be destroyed by too much heat or too much cold, that God's going to take care of all of that. And then in spite of what we do, God is going to bring about perfect environment. Don't worry about it. I know the final chapter. Matthew 5.16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. We need to be concerned about that, about our testimony. Now, there needs to be the testimony of the life, how we live, but nobody is going to be saved because you're simply a good guy, a nice person because they will come to know how good you are, and they will never get to know how good God is. And so we need also to have the testimony of the lips. Oftentimes, too, we have problems uh, in witnessing to others because there's contention, there's strife, and often our own personal desires override any thoughts about bringing the gospel to others. So what should we do? Well, make it your goal to be pleasing to God. That needs to be number one in, the, in your life. Paul says, we make this our aim, to be well-pleasing to him. 2 Corinthians 5, 9. That needs to be the goal of our life in every area. What can I do here, now, in this situation to glorify God? And then we can set spiritual goals. We need to think about this. What are the goals for my spiritual life? And then we need to develop plans. Evangelism is done on purpose. And if you don't think about it, you probably won't do it until it becomes just a part of who you are. People get scared. But it says in Psalm 138.3, In the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Why don't Christians witness? Well, many people say, well, I'm afraid they're going to ask me something that I don't know the answer to. Some people ask me questions all the time, and I don't know, and sometimes I have to say, I don't have any idea. But I, I'll try to find out. I'll go study this. Let's get together next week, and I'll try to answer your question. Don't be afraid. I mean, you, <laughs> right here, this congregation, I mean, you are some of the best taught people in all the world. You should have no fear that somebody's going to ask you a question that you don't know the answer to, and even if they should, you can say, I have resources to find out the answer, and call up your pastor. No. <laughs> Go dig it out. Go look in your Bible. So don't be afraid, but this is a very common response. Well, I'm afraid they're going to ask me something I don't know. Or people say, I don't know how to witness. There are a lot of witnessing programs, and some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But it's not a matter of 
actually learning a program. It's a matter of knowing the gospel. And all of you have been taught, what is the gospel? Jesus died for your sins. Now, that is the basic statement of the gospel. And if you can tell somebody, Jesus died for your sins, Jesus is your substitute, he paid the penalty for your sins, well, you've given them the gospel. Now, I hope you have more information than that, but uh, it's not a matter of saying, well, I, I really don't know how to witness. We can talk about different strategies that you can use, different approaches that you might use, but this idea, I don't know how, well, learn how. I don't speak well. Well, that sounds to me like Moses. Well, Lord, you know, I don't speak very well. <laughs> you don't have to speak well. Even the preacher doesn't have to speak well. I mean, you look at Moses. God says, who made your mouth? I made it. Don't tell me you have a stammer, a stutter. Don't tell me you don't speak well. <laughs> God will use you. You all communicate very well. And people will understand. I don't know how to introduce talking about spiritual things. Well, just take anything they say and say, have you thought about how that relates to your eternal destiny? Or what does that have to do with eternal life? It's, or I'm afraid people might remember bad things I've done or said. Well, I can't talk to my brother or my mother because I did some bad things, and they're going to say, well, you hypocrite. Here, you want to talk to me about going to heaven after what you did. Don't be afraid of that. Say, yeah, I did those bad things, and you want to know what? Jesus died for that. Jesus suffered because I did that really stupid, horrible thing, and I've been forgiven, and that's the grace of God. Let me tell you about this grace of, involved in forgiveness. Don't be afraid to witness just because you have something in your background. The problem is sometimes it's personal, and uh, now you have a problem with the relationship but we still have a responsibility to give the gospel. And then, well, I don't have time, or I'm just not motivated in that area. Sometimes people say, I don't have the gift. Well, very few people do, and yet that's our responsibility. You may not have a gift of intercession, and yet you still pray. You may not have a, a, a gift of giving, and yet you still give. And so we have responsibilities even if we are not especially gifted in a particular area. Now, there are a lot of programs designed for mass evangelism, and sometimes we want to uh, let somebody else do it. And so uh, we've had revivals. Churches used to have revivals once or twice a year where they'd have some visiting fireman come in, and uh, he's he's going to get up there and, and preach a really strong sermon for five nights or uh, <clears throat> a little longer. And uh, and this was a time often the church would, they, they would invite their family, invite their neighbors. Oh, we're, we're having this special uh, time at church. Why won't you come uh, and uh, just just listen for one night? And and that used to be a very popular thing to do. It doesn't happen much anymore. There are still some places where they do it, but it's becoming very rare. Then there were crusades. We think about the Billy Graham crusades and uh, going back to the 19th century when uh, you had the uh, great uh, Brush Arbor meetings, the uh, revivals that uh, were held out in small towns, and they put up tents or they built big bonfires and they had meetings, and uh, a lot of people got saved through those. And then uh, came into the uh, late part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. You had people like uh, D.L. Moody, who gave the gospel to millions of people in America and the British Isles. You had other evangelists that uh, also did a lot of work, uh, weren't so well known. 
And then, of course, we had Billy Graham in our lifetime. And uh, they would have these great revivals, these great crusades where tens of thousands of people would fill up a stadium. And uh, there were some people that got saved uh, as a result of those. But these are almost passe now. It's very difficult for crusade-type evangelists to get many people to come out and hear them anymore. They're going to be a thing of the past. And then you have media events. Sometimes somebody will buy up time on uh, television, on the Internet. There are films that are put out that are designed to uh, give the gospel. And... Uh, these uh, have had some success, but it's very limited success. Uh, not that many people were actually saved as a result of mass evangelism efforts. And then there are a lot of programs designed for personal evangelism. And some of these are very good programs, like Evantel. They have some wonderful literature. They have a good program to try to train people in how to give the gospel. Campus Crusade, uh, they have their own approach and uh, they've been responsible for giving the gospel to millions and millions of people all over the world, particularly on college campuses. Many people have been saved as a result of their, their efforts. Same with the Navigators. Uh, then there's, uh, we have programs like Evangelism Explosion. Uh, there have been many programs like this designed to train people in how to give the gospel. Evangelism Explosion is one of the best where it, it's designed to train people in giving the gospel and to get people actually involved in doing it. Uh, if you go through the program, it's a training program and it's, uh, it's very good. Uh, something that takes place over two or three months and uh, people actually go out and get experience little by little, step by step. Uh, they get involved in giving the gospel to, to those who are lost. So uh, these things uh, can be used to greater or lesser degrees of success. And, uh, and yet, what if you don't have these programs? What if you don't go through these programs? These programs come and they, they go. Some have been very popular and they'll be popular for a few years and then they're forgotten and then somebody comes up with a, a new program. It's simply another way of uh, putting the same thing in a, in a new package and they're, they're trying to get people involved in witnessing. For me it's the, the package is not the important thing. It's what's on the inside. And we need to get people involved in talking about the Lord and his plan of salvation. Now, the reality is most people come to faith in Christ as a result of family and friends witnessing to them in personal evangelism. The great majority of people come to faith in Christ, not because of an evangelist in mass evangelism, crusade evangelism, revivals. Very few people are saved that way. But rather it's through this personal contact. You sit down with somebody, you talk to them, you tell them about the Lord. And that's the way most people come to faith in Christ. And we need to be about the Lord's business and talking to others. And I believe that he will bless that. So we have an opportunity uh, to go out to uh, the fairgrounds. And this is really very non-threatening. I think it will be good for you to go. I hope you will sign up. I want to encourage you. Go out and at least watch. And even if you are too timid to talk to somebody about faith in Christ, watch others do it. And while they are talking to somebody about the Lord, pray for them. And you will be involved in this process of evangelism. Now, here, here's the questionnaire that uh, is going to be used out at the fairground. I thought I'd go through this very quickly with you. But you can see this is very non-threatening. What you get uh, is they're going to have a, 
uh, just a survey with questions on it. They asked people, will you take this survey? We're just trying to uh, get a feel for, you know, what is the thinking of people in this area with regard to uh, some questions related to spiritual things. Would you be willing to take this survey? That's very non-threatening. Did you grow up with any sort of spiritual church background? Well, that's not threatening. Do you believe that there is one God? Are you a monotheist? Or there are many gods. Maybe you're a polytheist. Or do you believe there's no God? You're an atheist. Well, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. Then you're an agnostic. Check that. Do you believe there are uh, more absolutes? Well, just should be more. Are there absolutes? A definite right and wrong. Have you ever personally done something you know to be wrong? Are there consequences for doing wrong? So people just write the answers to this. So it's not that you're in their face. It's just a survey. What's grace? What does it mean? Can people define that? Uh, do you think there's a heaven and a hell? What do you think of your personal chances of making it into heaven? You know, all the way from I'm absolutely sure to um, I have absolutely no chance at all of going to heaven. So people can choose. If you believe you might go to heaven, why would God let you in? And would you say that heaven is a free gift, or is it something you have to earn? And how important is the Bible when it comes to what you believe? All right, you just take them through this. They answer the questions. They write out the questions. Uh, and maybe you can engage them in a conversation about their answers to these questions. But you can do this in a way that's not threatening at all. You're just going to ask them some questions. And we need to do this. I think that it, it will be good for us as a body of believers to get out and do this. Because you're going to see people out there that are lost. And they don't have any idea of how lost they are. And they don't have really any idea that there's a solution to their problem. And we can go out and we can point them in the right direction. We can tell them there is a Savior. And I think that if we do this, it's going to be very beneficial for you as an individual, but also for the church. And we may see people saved, and that that's thrilling. That's exciting. And uh, we need to be praying about this event that's coming up. I thought you might uh, like to see one of the um, methods that we use in Kiev. Uh, what we did, we got reproductions made of 20 master paintings, all dealing with some biblical subject. And some are Ukrainian. Some are Dutch masters from the Renaissance era, but they all, in one way, deal with a biblical topic. It may be Abraham ready to slay his son Isaac. They even have one picture of the second coming of Christ, a uh, rather interpretive uh, view, but it's a, it's a good painting. Others have uh, John the Baptist saying, Behold the Lamb of God. And with these paintings... Uh, people can say, now this is a, a painting, this was done in the 17th century by this uh, well-known Dutch painter, and well, what do you see in the picture? What, what is this picture about? Let me explain to you why he painted this picture. This goes back to a story in the Bible, and uh, the thing is, we go out and we set up these paintings in the park. And people see all these paintings, and they, what is this, a, an art sale? It's uh, an exhibition, what's going on here? And they walk up to us. And they say, well, what is this? What's going on? Well, we, we just have these paintings. Uh, they're, they're reproductions of famous paintings, and uh, we just wanted to display these things and uh, talk to people about the paintings. And so from any one of these paintings now, you can give the gospel or you can take people down the row, painting after painting, and uh, you can lead them in, in that direction 
uh, where you're going to have an opportunity then to uh, <clears throat> tell them about Jesus. So this is just one of the things that we do. Uh, we also uh, have things for children. Uh, we, we make up uh, these gospel bracelets. If you're familiar with the wordless book that CEF uses, well, we do the same thing with bracelets. We put beads on a, uh, on a leather piece, and uh, we don't just give them the bracelet, but we tell them the story as we make the bracelet for the children. Okay, this, this one represents heaven, and this represents sin, and this represents uh, the gospel message, Christ died for your sins, and this, one, this bead represents faith, and then you uh, put it together and you give it to the child, and uh, you say, okay, now what, what are each of these colors for? And you can go through and give them the gospel in, in that way. And uh, it's also interesting that as we do this for children, parents and grandparents listen at the same time. Um, and uh, then we also use something called the Evangie Cube and other things. It, but it's out in the park, and it's very, uh, very non-threatening. It's, uh, um, it's, a, it's a nice way to, uh, to get people involved. And we've had people from the church, and, well, I, I can't go out and talk about Jesus, but they'll go out to the park, and they'll watch others do it, and it's interesting, after an hour or so, they'll, they'll even get involved in the conversation. Oh, well, let me tell you about this picture. I know about this picture. I can tell you about this one. And uh, they'll actually get involved uh, a little at a time. Now, I've got to admit, we haven't seen a lot of people come to faith in Christ as a result of this. But it's been wonderful for the church. Because now you have people, they've been out there, they've been exposed to talking to strangers, witnessing to others, and it makes it much more comfortable for them now to go and talk to their neighbors or to talk to family members about their, their need for salvation. So, um, all right, well... All right, our topic actually is missions, and uh, I think that evangelism is a part of that, and we need to be thinking about that as a body of believers. Missions is something that is on the decline in America. We reached our peak after World War II. There were so many soldiers who came back from Europe, from Asia, from the South Pacific, and they said there are so many lost people and we need to take the gospel. And thousands, tens of thousands of Americans went to the mission field after World War II. Well, almost all of those who went as missionaries after World War II are dead. Just got old, went home to be with the Lord. And the number of American missionaries going out has greatly declined. Now, sometimes the missiologists... They, they, they want to paint a, a more rosy picture, and they say, well, we have as many missionaries, foreign missionaries today as we've ever had. Yeah, maybe, but they are not well-grounded. Many of them uh, do not have a very clear gospel, and probably three-fourths of the new missionaries going out are from the Far East, from places like Korea. And uh, while we admire their zeal, oftentimes their gospel is very confused. We need to be concerned about missions and missionaries. What we have seen in our experience is that missionaries are a reflection of the churches from which they come. You stop and think about churches today. What are they teaching? 
What are their methods? And these are the missionaries who go out and basically they're going to reproduce what they have seen at home. We need to be missions oriented. I believe God has given us the task of being missionaries. Now, not everyone can be a missionary. If everyone's a missionary, there aren't going to be churches here. So we need to have churches, but churches need to be missions oriented so that we're, we're thinking about our responsibility, not only here at home, but what are we doing to take the gospel in other places? And we need to be concerned about that. And we need to support these people and we need to uh, encourage them and promote them. We need to have a missions committee here that is going to promote missions to the congregation, but also one that will have a ministry to missionaries. One thing that has been my experience is that churches expect that I will communicate with them. I need to send out newsletters. I need to keep them informed, and rightly so. But they never communicate with me. They don't write to me and tell me what they're doing. They don't, uh, it's just like it's, uh, well, you know, we'll give you financial support, but uh, that's all we're going to do. And I think that the church can have a great ministry to encouraging missionaries because the reality is that missions has changed so much in our lifetime. Missions has changed dramatically in the last 25 years in that people will go to the mission field, they'll be there for a year, two years, they come home. These are short-term missionaries. And oftentimes those who say, well, no, I'm going to be a career missionary. This is what I'm going to do. Very few of them are going back after their first three to five years. They're coming back home. And I think part of the reason why is they're not getting support from the home church. They don't get any encouragement. They're out there all by themselves, and the, it can be very lonely. Uh, if you're living in a foreign culture, you're in a place where you don't hear your native language, and uh, the culture can be very different, and you begin to think, what am I doing here? And oftentimes on the mission field, you may not be seeing a lot of results, so you can go out and preach the gospel, and you don't have any converts. So people get discouraged. Why am I doing this? I might as well go home. I might as well go be comfortable. But we need to be ministering to people who are on the field. We need to let them know, hey, we're behind you. We're concerned about what's happening. And we want you to know we're praying for you and we're praying for the work that you're doing. So we need to have a ministry to missionaries that goes beyond mere financial support. God is a God of missions, and we see missions throughout the Old Testament. We can see it in, in many different ways with those who would preach the gospel. Think about Noah. He, he was called a preacher of righteousness. He wasn't just building a big boat. He was also proclaiming the gospel message as he was building it. Judgment is coming, and you need to have a Savior and so Noah was a preacher of righteousness. We see the, uh, that Abraham was also one who was going to take the gospel message from where he was in Ur of the Chaldees, and he was to take it with him. And Israel is going to be a missionary nation. It was designed by God to be such. In Joshua 4.23 we read, the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord. Now you see, when, when the spies went to Jericho, Rahab said, everybody's afraid of you. Everybody has heard what God did. 
at the Red Sea. God has protected you. God has defeated your enemies. <laughs> people are scared to death of you. The point is that people needed to hear about this God and who, who he is and what he will do and what he is going to provide. We have David. He went to fight Goliath. God gave David victory, not simply to set the Israelites free from the Philistine oppression. But he says in 1 Samuel 17, 46, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You see, they were to be the missionaries. They were to evangelize the Gentiles. And even when Solomon was building the, the temple, when he dedicated the temple, he's got this wonderful prayer. He says, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, See, the foreigner, the Gentiles, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel. They had a responsibility in evangelism. God manifests himself in different ways. And we should take advantage of the circumstances around us in our mission. In 2 Kings 19.19, 19, Sennacherib had surrounded the city of Jerusalem. He is threatening to absolutely destroy it. And there's a prayer. The king prays. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. Do you pray for deliverance? Why would you pray for deliverance? Why do you pray for healing? Why do you pray that God will spare America? Why do you do that? Well, so I can be comfortable. I don't like suffering. Well, of course, nobody does. But what is our objective? You see, we need to be praying that God is going to be glorified. And if he gives the answer to our prayer, then we need to be praising God. Praise God that he answered that prayer for healing. And we ought to give him a lot of praise. Do we do that? Or are we like the nine lepers that got healed and never said thank you? Yeah, I prayed for it, but... You know, I forgot that I prayed for it, so God doesn't get the credit in my thinking. But rather, we need to have that focus. I'm going to glorify God. So, see, Hezekiah is praying here, not just so that he can be saved from destruction, but so that all the people will hear about what God has done. That's what we need to do is broadcast this good news. What a great God I have. Isn't he wonderful? And if he doesn't answer the way that I've asked, then we need to look at how God will be glorified in that circumstance. It may be that God will be glorified to a greater extent by allowing the suffering to go on. But he will be glorified through his people who trust him and who are willing to follow him. So what, what is biblical missions? It can be defined as the propagation of the word of God so that all might know the one and only true God. It's spreading that good news. Now missions, usually we think of foreign missions. There is something that is called home missions, but for me, missions is one who is sent to a culture not his own. Uh, 
And so it's the spreading of the gospel. Now the word missionary and the word missions not used in the Bible, but certainly spreading the gospel by witnessing and through the gift of evangelism, that's something that's commanded. It's interesting, you look at the word Hebrew. Abraham was a Hebrew. <laughs> it means one from beyond or one from the other side. Well, Abraham crossed the Euphrates River, so it's one who crosses the river and proclaims the word of God in another country. And Israel was to be the missionary agency before the church began. They were to be a light to the Gentiles. They were called to be a light to the Gentiles. So there are many missionary passages in the Old Testament. We have not the time tonight of course, you're very familiar with the book of Jonah. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh. He was to preach to um, those people, take them the gospel. He didn't want to go. He didn't like those people. He didn't want to see them saved. I mean, who'd want to spend eternity with those people? <laughs> but ultimately, he did go, and he did take the message, and God was glorified through that. And so we are called to preach the gospel. So missionaries, we have been entrusted with the gospel. You've been given the gospel. God has deposited the gospel with you. He made a deposit in your account. Put the gospel in there. So you've been entrusted with it. Also, we have been sent forth. We have a commission. Paul says... Pray for me that God would open to me a door for the word. Colossians 4.3, he says that I may minister, that I may make it known as I ought to speak. By the way, the Apostle Paul said, pray for me that I will have boldness, that I will have courage to proclaim the gospel as I ought to. We think Paul was fearless. Oh, he was just one of these people that just, he could go out there and never have any qualms about giving the gospel. Paul says, you need to pray for me. We need to pray for missionaries. Missionaries are not some super status saints. They struggle with things just as you struggle here at home. Pray for them. Missionaries go to foreign lands. 2 Corinthians 1.11 Paul says, You helped me by praying. Let me call that up. Second Corinthians 1.11, you also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Paul says, praying for us. Your prayers were a great help. I thank all of you who have prayed for us. We don't take that lightly. And we were, here we are. So the Lord was pleased to hear and answer your prayer. Thank you. But don't cease to pray. Sandy sends out the prayer list. Do you go through that? We need to be in prayer. We need to be serious about this. But pray for our missionaries. And Paul also indicates that the local church receives blessing by generous and active support of missions. It'll be a blessing to you. All right, we, we have a lot of things to talk about with regard to missions, so we'll be doing that over the next uh, couple of weeks. So we'll see you Sunday morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that someone was faithful to give us the gospel. Maybe it was 
a mother, a father, some other family member, a faithful teacher, maybe a friend. But I thank you that there were people who were faithful, not ashamed of the gospel. They were ready to give the gospel, and, and they did. And as a result of this, we came to see our need for a Savior. We came to see your provision of a Savior. And we thank you that we can have that salvation and we can know it. Father, you have given us responsibilities here that we also should give the gospel to others. May we be faithful in doing this. May we think about our responsibility in this area. May we be diligent. May we think more about pleasing you than being pleasing to people. And we would pray for this evangelism event coming up at Fort Bend uh, at the fairgrounds. We, we, we don't know who's going to be there, but you do, and you've already made preparation for them. I just pray that we might be useful in, in giving the gospel. And Father, we pray that uh, we might be useful in bringing people to faith in Christ, but if not, may we make them without excuse. And Father, we do pray for those who are serving you in far-flung places. They're away from home, away from family, away from familiar things. They need encouragement. And so I pray that this day you're going to cause something to happen in their experience that's just going to lift their spirits, that's going to encourage them, that's going to make them so glad that they made the decision to serve you wherever they are. So I'm just asking that you will intervene and just uh, bring the light to them because they have served you. I thank you for this time that we've had together tonight. I pray that you'll bless it. May it encourage us. May it motivate us, stimulate our thinking with regard to the things that we have to do that we might fulfill your purpose, that in all things you might be glorified through us and through the church. Pray that you'll take us safely to our homes and then give us grace that again we can come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.